So the title of my sermon today is Hope Does Not Disappoint. It's all about hope. Uh, now, before I was converted, I was like most people in the world, I, uh, regarding my beliefs about the, the distant future. And when I talk about the distant future, I mean like what happens after I die. I really had a feeling that there might be something that uh, would happen after, after death, uh, this physical death, but uh, whatever that was, was kind of bewildering to me. And mostly, these beliefs that I had weren't based on any solid foundation. I really hadn't uh, dug into the Bible at all uh, at that point in my life. And I just wasn't sure, based on what the world will tell you, about what the purpose of the afterlife or life after death might be. You talk to uh, many people in the world and they'll say that they expect their life after their physical death to be some kind of uh, spiritual bliss. Is that all it really was going to be? As a question that I wanted to understand and I really didn't believe that there was uh, much compelling about that. It definitely didn't seem very purposeful to just, oh, have a, a, a simple uh, spiritual existence where we're doing nothing other than uh, sitting around and enjoying life in the clouds. That kind of thing sounds good on the surface. Uh, and that's why maybe it's compelling to people in the world that they won't have to do hard work anymore, <laughs> or at least they don't think that that's what they think. Um, but it, there's really a void of purpose there. Uh, and that, that's something that struck me. It, it seemed very meaningless to have an existence. I really thought there was more to hope for than just that. Uh, now, early on, uh, very early on, I was interested in understanding uh, the purpose of life, uh, what my life was uh, meaningful for, and I really did believe that it, uh, what I did would matter. I feel that it matters. I feel that it's more than just an existence where I've got some biology that's functioning and then someday won't. There's more to life than that. But there's only more to life if there's a plan and if there's a purpose. And of course, if uh, a plan and a purpose that spans beyond the, the life of you and I, our physical lives, that's got to come from God. It must. But when God isn't in the picture, there's no plan, there's no purpose, and meaning winds up being void beyond anything that we might live uh, in this, this time that we're on earth in a physical existence. So now that I've had my mind open to the truth, that now that I understand what God's plan really is, as it's plainly written in the Bible, life has tremendous meaning, immense meaning. And the Feast of Tabernacles that you and I are observing, are, uh, this provides a, a focal point for what our life is going to culminate uh, into. It gives us an idea of what our purpose really is. Now, something that I've always liked about the Feast of Tabernacles is that is, it is very forward-looking. It's about the future. It's about something that will happen. Nominal Christianity will tell you that the Feast of Tabernacles is obsolete, that uh, it's done away with, in fact. Many people don't even know what it is, even though Jesus Christ himself kept this Feast of Tabernacles. They will tell you that it's stuck in the past, that it's an antique. But that could not be any further from the truth. It did have uh, its role in the past, but it is all about what is going to happen in the future. And you and I understand that. Brethren, the Feast of Tabernacles, as we observe it, as we understand what it represents, it gives us something to hope for. It represents the beginning of a monumental victory over evil. And we get to be a part of that. 
In the future, we can look forward to the millennium, of course, that 1,000 year period where Satan will be bound and be prevented from uh, trying to distract uh, people living on earth from uh, the way of righteousness. Jesus Christ will reign on earth and righteousness will uh, prevail. Uh, the righteous government of God will be presented to all the world. Nobody will be hidden from the truth at that point in time like they are today. And the first fruits at that point in time when Christ is reigning on the earth will be changed to spirit. They will be gods. And all of it is for a reason. God wants to build his family. He wants to establish righteousness. And he wants to get us involved in participating in his creation. These are such big ideas. It's absolutely immense when you begin to think about it. The words really don't even begin to communicate the kinds of things that we'll be involved in. The words are here in our Bible, but uh, there's, uh, until we actually get to participate with, uh, within that, uh, we can only get glimpses uh, of comprehension of what this means. All of these things, the millennium, that Jesus Christ reigning on earth, being changed to spirit beings, being involved in his creation, these are things that we can hope for. Hope, of course, is definitively forward-looking. We don't hope for things that have happened already in the past. We hope for things that can possibly happen in the future. And there are two aspects about hope that, are, uh, that make it distinguishable. And these are brought out in Scripture, in fact. So the first of the two aspects of hope involve a goal and a purpose. This is where something very specific is involved. We're looking for a, a clear, specific outcome. That's a key characteristic of a goal. Now, what is the outcome that we are looking for? Uh, I give you a preview of what some of those things are, but I'll be talking about more of that in a moment. Now, the second part of hope is that it involves our ability to affect the fulfillment and the outcome of that goal. We have the power to influence uh, whether we will or won't achieve our goals. If we have something good to look forward to, and, but we lack control, if you take away that, uh, that agency, you don't have hope anymore. What you have is wishing. And brethren, we have control over whether or not these uh, goals of ours can be uh, obtained. We don't have to wish for it. We can do something about it. So those two aspects of hope are what we'll be looking into today. So what are our Christian goals? What can we hope for? I want to draw your attention to a few of the very awesome things that we have as goals in our Christian lives. These are things that we look forward to, that we can influence the fulfillment of in our lives uh, as uh, a part of the body of Christ. Many of these things uh, we've heard about before, but I'm going to give you a, a, some of the highlights for uh, what we can look forward to, things that are still out in front of us. Turn with me to 1 John 4, and we'll read verses 9 through 11. 1 John 4, beginning in verse 9, we read, In this the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. We have a goal of obtaining salvation, eternal life, through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. This is something uh, that we talk about a lot. It is fundamental 
to the nature of Christianity in general. Um, this is something that even nominal Christians will tell you that they look forward to. Uh, but it is central, of course, to uh, the plan of God and the purpose of our lives. What we notice here is the role of love. Love is the reason that God offers the opportunity for us to live eternally. He loves us, you and me. He loves the world so much, of course, that he gave his uh, only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to suffer and die and be sacrificed for our sake so that we can be part of his family and get this, uh, achieve this goal. He wants that outcome for us. But we are given an instruction here as well. We are to love others as God loves us. This is something for us to do. We have hope that we will obtain eternal life. That is one of our goals. Let's go over to 1 Corinthians 15 and read verses 51 through 53. 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 53, or 51, rather. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. There will be a transformation in our lives. These fleshly, carnal, physical bodies that we uh, have right now, these aren't going to be the kinds of uh, bodies that we have in uh, the time to come. We will be changed into spirit beings. Uh, what is fascinating here is that uh, my wife and I often reflect on this, I think she pointed it out to me, uh, that there is a generation that will not experience physical death. Can you imagine that? Some of the first fruits will be alive at the time that Christ returns, and those people will not experience physical death. They will be changed in a, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, from physical to spirit, just like that. Brethren, we have hope that our bodies of flesh will, will be changed into spiritual a spiritual existence. That is one of the goals that we look forward to. And we understand how that will happen. Uh, the Bible gives us the instruction there. Since we're in 1 Corinthians 15, let's go down to verse 54 and read through uh, verse 58. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain, in the Lord. Uh, what else do we have to look forward to here? What are the goals that we are trying to achieve? The end of death? That's a pretty good one, uh, I think. It's definitely something to look forward to, definitely something to work on uh, together. And we have a way to obtain that. That is th through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, as it's written here. That is the only way that death will uh, be obliterated. But we also have to take some action to do that. A lot of these scriptures that I'm going through not only talk about a, a goal, but it talks about how to obtain it. It uh, um, puts a little too much together here for the way I've organized this sermon, but it's, uh, you just can't avoid it. Not only do we have the ability to achieve our goals, we also have a way of doing it. And how is that? Well, we abound in the work. As we heard in the sermonette today, there is work that we can do. We can participate in the work of God. 
We have hope, then, brethren, that our work in overcoming sin and strengthening our conversion will lead us to immortality. That's something to hope for as well. Let's go over to 1 John 3 and read verses 2 through 3. 1 John 3, beginning in verse 2. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself, just as he is pure. Whew. Now we get into the territory where... Uh, these are, these are pieces of truth that are plainly written in the Bible that you can go down to the, the church down the street and say that um, we'll be gods and that we'll be able to see God as he is. We'll be children of God. They won't really fully comprehend that. We will be able to see God. Nobody has been able to do that uh, and live as the Bible states. We will be like God. We'll be the children of God, members of his family. We will be of the God kind. Uh, we also notice that this is an object of hope. We can't avoid it here. This is something that we hope for. And there, were, there is a way of achieving that goal. And that's by doing what? Purifying ourselves. We have the ability to affect the outcome of this goal. The goal and the way of achieving it are necessary parts of hope, and they're both described here. Therefore, brethren, we have hope that we will become purified and become gods, part of the family of God. So that gives us a, a glimpse into the future of um, the transformation that will happen in our lives. Let's go over to Isaiah 2 and uh, read about something else that's very uh, great and monumental for us to look forward to. Isaiah 2, and I'll read verses 2 through 4. Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains, and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations uh, shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, Come, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations, and rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. This is a frequently cited scripture during the Feast of Tabernacles because it describes the way of life that, will, uh, uh, that we will all be experiencing at the time of the millennium, when the government of Jesus Christ reigns on this earth. People will want to hear the truth. There will be peace that abounds. People will live without violence and without war. Brethren, we have hope that the kingdom of God will be established on earth and all of the pain and agony that uh, is so built into the ways of this world will be gone. That's a goal to look forward to and something else that this world does not want to hear. At least not right now, but they will. Let's go to Isaiah 65 and read verses 17 through 19. This is a Another uh, great description of a wonderful moment in the future. Isaiah 65 and verse 17. For behold, I create, a new, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered or come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem as a rejoicing, and her people a joy. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and join and joy in my people. The voice of weeping shall no longer be heard in her, nor the voice of crying. 
tremendous joy if there's something to have as a goal. And joy is one of the, the greatest things that we can look forward to. There will no longer be sorrow. Uh, there will no longer be any sadness or crying. There will be happy people, joyful people, and all of them will be living in a way that God wants them to live. Brethren, we have hope that sorrow will be destroyed. We have hope that joy will prevail and happiness will abound in, the, um, in time to come, in that wonderful government that God is going to be establishing. This is the fulfillment of the plan of God that we can look forward to. Uh, let's go over to Romans 8 and read verses 20 through 21. So in the Isaiah 65, we read about the creation of a new heavens and a new earth. And we read the, uh, the next episode of that in Romans 8 and verses 20 through 21. For the creation was subjected to futility. Not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from bondage, from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. <laughs> Did you catch that? That creation, that new creation uh, that God is going to be uh, creating, is going to be turned over into the hands of of the children of God. That's you and me. This, uh, all of God's creation will be uh, ours to work with. This is the purpose of our spiritual lives. We will be participating in the process and the activity of creation when we are living as spirit beings, as gods in the God family in the future. We're not going to be just sitting around the swimming pool, soaking up the sun, drinking refreshing beverages. No, we'll be continuing to do work, but it will be so fulfilling. It's not going to be agonizing work where we're challenged and uh, have to deal with tremendous uh, conflict and obstacles. No, brethren, we have hope that we will be participating in the work of God in the future. Will be participating in creation. This blows my mind. It really does, and I hope you get a grasp of of this as well. So, given the overview of what we have as our goals, I think it's very clear that we have a tremendous amount of meaning in our lives, and a tremendous amount of huge goals, monstrous ones. And we have, of course, these things to look forward to. We have the ability to achieve these goals as well. Uh, and uh, this should give us all hope. That, uh, in fact, brethren, it must give us hope. Hope is an absolute necessary part of being a Christian. We have to have it. If we don't, then we're missing out. You know, we... Uh, won't be able to really fulfill the purpose of life that God has provided for us. Now that we understand what some of these goals are, uh, I think it's important to also look at um, making sure that our hope is aligned correctly. We have to have the right kind of hope. We have to have the right goals, and we have to go about uh, achieving these goals in the right way. So, how can we affect the successful outcome of these goals? What can we do? Before I go into exactly what we can do, and what we have to do, in fact, we'll look at what we shouldn't do. <laughs> we'll look at the wrong way of doing it. Basically, what this boils down to is not trusting in 100% uh, in our own abilities. If we want to achieve these uh, huge, righteous goals that God has given for us, we can't do it on our own. That's what it amounts to. Let's go over to Job 
6, and we'll read verses 11 through 13. Going over to Job 6, read verses 11 through 13. Okay. Uh, what strength do I have that I should hope? What and what is my end that I should prolong my life? Is my strength the strength of stones or my, is my flesh bronze? Is my help not within me and is success driven from me? Now, during the time that Job is uh, uttering these words, he's not yet been made aware of his sin. He's expressing his hopelessness, but he's also expressing his hopelessness in uh, the human terms. He's talking about that his strength is not enough to provide him hope. He's talking about his flesh not giving him uh, a way of hoping. His help is not within him. He can't do things on his own. That's the point that he's making here. Of course, he's uh, discussing this in a way where he's just frustrated with the, uh, the problems that he's uh, enduring. He's finding himself powerless to really uh, overcome these problems. He can't achieve his goals with his own strength is what it boils down to. And, uh, of course, he's trying to trust in his own strength. And when that happens, when he doesn't trust in God's strength to help overcome uh, the problems and achieve uh, his goals, and the same applies for us, when we don't trust in God, we can't achieve our goals. Period. That's it. And, uh, that is especially true when we think about our Christian goals. Our Christian goals are these uh, ultimate, magnificent outcomes of turning into spirit beings, God's kingdom being established here, and having a role in the creation. That's not anything that we can do on our own strength. We need God. Let's go over to Jeremiah 17 and read verses 5 through 6. Jeremiah 17 in verse 5. Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. For he shall be like a shrub in the desert, and shall not see when good comes, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land which is not inhabited. <laughs> Plain words here, if we think about them. When we ha have hope that involves the wrong method of achievement, when we trust in man instead of God, what's the outcome? Not so good. <clears throat> We're doomed to failure. We wind up inhabiting the parched places, the really crummy parts of the world. The, uh, this is not what God wants for us. But that's the result, the end result, when we trust in our own strength. Now, turn back to Isaiah 30, and we'll read verses 1 through 3. Isaiah 30, and verse 1. Woe to the rebellious children, says the Lord, who take counsel, but not of me, and who devise plans, but not of my spirit that they may add sin to sin, who walk to go down to Egypt and have not asked my advice to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh and to trust in the shadow of Egypt. Therefore, the strength of Pharaoh shall be your shame and the trust in the shadow of Egypt shall be your humiliation. Well, we can see the two ways of doing things. <laughs> With God or without God. Uh, that's what it boils down to. And when our plans are not in sync with what God's plans are, there's a pretty severe warning and condemnation here. Egypt, in, in these uh, scriptures here, and as we know, is a, uh, a symbolic way of describing a way of sin. And 
When we trust in simple ways to accomplish what we set out as our goals, <laughs> we add sin to sin, and uh, therefore we aren't seeking the guidance of God. The guidance of God will not cause us and lead us to sin. When that happens, there's failure. In fact, there's humiliation and shame. Any hope that we have must be in accordance with what God desires. We seek the same goal that God has in mind. That is uh, first and foremost what we need to be doing. Turn with me to Lamentations 3, uh, verses 18 through 33. Lamentations 3, verses 18 through 33, that slender book in the Bible between Jeremiah and Ezekiel. Verse 18, And I said, My strength and my hope have perished from the Lord. Remember my affliction and roaming, the wormwood and the gall. My soul still remembers and sinks within me. This I recall to my mind. Therefore, I have hope. Through the Lord's uh, mercies, we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should hope and wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man to bear the yoke in his youth. Let him sit alone and keep silent, because God has laid it on him. Let him put his mouth in the dust. There may yet be hope. Let him give his cheek to the one who strikes him, and be full of reproach. For the Lord will not cast off forever. Though he causes grief, yet he will show compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. For he does not afflict willingly, nor grieve the children of men. Here we see a transition. We see a transition from the hopelessness of sin. Jeremiah, uh, in this book of Lamentations, opens up by describing how his hope is failing, or the, the hope of the people that he's with is, is failing, but it's related to sin. It's the hope in man. But then we see the hopefulness that is a result when God is trusted, when people have faith in God. We shift our hope to be in submission with God's will. We have the same object and desire and the same method of accomplishing uh, our goals. When we hope in that way, God is willing to bless us and protect us. He wants us to patiently be obedient to him and not give up. Even if we endure uh, difficulties and trials right now, it's going to be worth it. So it's clear that we can't trust in man, can't trust in our own strength, and we need to trust in God. How do we do that? We have a way of trusting in God but uh, let's try and put a little bit more substance behind that. Turn with me to Colossians 1, and we'll read verses 24 through 27. Colossians uh, 1, beginning in verse 24. I now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up my flesh, uh, and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ, for the sake of his body, which is the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God, which was given to me for you, to fulfill the word of God, the mystery which has been hidden from the ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. 
There it is. With Jesus Christ living and working within us and through us, that is our means of hope. Without Jesus Christ working within us, giving us uh, the Holy Spirit of God to help us make decisions and live righteously and overcome sin, unless we have that, we can't achieve the goals, uh, the spiritual goals that God has set out for us, the ones that are close to our heart. In fact, Jesus Christ offers us the only way of fulfilling these goals. We need to start with Jesus Christ living and working within us. That's how we can hope in God. That's the beginning of the means. So we have to trust in God. And we have to hope in God. And hope in God means that we trust in his promises. We have faith in his promises. I opened up citing a big list of promises that are described in the Bible. It is promised that we will have spiritual bodies, that we will be gods, that we will have a role in the creation. Those are promises. We hope When we hope in God, we hope in those promises. God's goal becomes our goal. They're one and the same. And in fact, with this uh, Holy Spirit of God working within us, it is literally the same goal. Think about that. Turn with me to Psalm 39, and we'll read verses 6 through 7. I've got quite a few uh, scriptures and psalms that we'll be going through. Getting near myself. All right, Psalm 39, beginning in verse 6. Surely every man walks about like a shadow. Surely they busy themselves in vain. He heaps up riches and does not know who will gather them. And now, Lord, what do I wait for? My hope is in you. We need to place our hope in the right thing. And that thing are the, is, is God. God's not a thing, of course. Uh, but anything that we hope for in this world is fleeting. If we try to accumulate riches or uh, accomplish even our, our human goals, those are fine, but they're not the end. It's not the ultimate uh, pursuit that we're trying to uh, participate in. We are looking to have the same goal as God. We have hope in God. Anything else is vain. Uh, turn back a few pages to Psalm 33, and we'll read uh, verses 18 through 22. Psalm 33 and verse 18. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his mercy, to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our hearts shall rejoice in him because we have trusted in his holy name. Let your mercy, O Lord, be upon us, just as we hope in you. The fear of God, as we heard about yesterday, and having the right goal of hope in God's mercy on us, that fear of God, uh, we bend our way of life to God's will, that proves our trust in God. And when we trust in God, he draws close to us. He offers us help and protection and mercy. And that action is reciprocal. As we draw close to God, he draws close to us. We hope in God, and he returns his hope in us, helping us to achieve the same goal that we both have mutually. The action, then, that we must take if we want to achieve our goals involves trusting God. This is what we do if we want our hope to be effective. Uh, turn over to Psalm 71, and we'll read verses 3 through 6. 
Psalm 71 and verse 3. Be my strong refuge, to which I may resort continually. You have given the commandment to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. Deliver me, O my God, out of the hand of the wicked, out of the hand of the unrighteous and cruel man. For you are my hope, O Lord God. You are my trust from my youth. By you I have been upheld from birth. You are he who took me out of my mother's womb. My praise shall be continually of you. In the face of danger, David looks to God for strength. He finds hope in his dire situations because he has the right source of strength. God is our only hope. He is in control of our circumstances. And by trusting him, we will be successful. And David here acknowledges all of his existence as a result of God's, God's will, his activity, his role in his life. And the same is true for us. From the very beginning of our lives, God has been involved. All right, turn with me to Psalm 146, and I'll read verses uh, 3 through 5. Psalm 146, and verse 3. Do not put your trust in princes, nor in a son of man, in whom there is no help. His spirit departs, he returns to his earth. In that very day, his plans perish. Happy is he who has the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord, his God. This is one of the, my favorite scriptures here in, in this sermon. Uh, there's an effect of happiness, which is pretty cool. When we trust in God, it gives us uh, a way of turning over our our grief, our, our troubles, to God. And when we have that relief, it really lifts the burden off of us, and it should be a source of joy and happiness, as it's written here. Not only do we have trust that God is in our lives, but we trust that his word is true, that uh, what he says will come about. We trust in his promises. That's pretty exciting when that happens. And it, knowing that we can trust in those promises, knowing that we have uh, a role and a purpose in God's family, if that doesn't give us happiness, well, we've really got to check ourselves. It must. It's something that is fundamentally a source of happiness. Uh, let's go over to 1 Timothy and read verse 1 of chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1, and verse 1, this is Paul's greeting. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior and the Lord Jesus Christ, our hope. Very plain and simple. Jesus Christ is our hope. As I opened up by him living in our lives, uh, we can be in perfect sync with the goals that uh, God has for us. And by Jesus Christ's sacrifice, we have the ultimate hope of salvation as well. That is the only means by which we can obtain eternal life. Turn with me over to Romans 5, and uh, we'll read verses 1 through 5 here. Romans 5, beginning in verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. 
And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. And perseverance, character. And character, hope. Now, hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which was given to us. We have hope through Jesus Christ, if we, as we have already established. It's the hope of salvation. It's uh, with the Spirit of God living within us. We have the, the same goals. And faith and hope are linked inextricably. You cannot separate them. It is necessary that we not only have these promises, but we believe that these promises will actually happen. We have to believe and have faith that they are true, that they will work. What I like about this is uh, there is a progression uh, by which we are led to having effective hope. Paul starts out writing about how we have hope through Jesus Christ, but then he talks about the uh, trials, and how we can glory in trials, and how that trials uh, wind up being that starting point by which we can obtain the true hope. Now, how does that work? Now, what, what purpose do trials serve right now? Trials are there to test us, plain and simple. And what's being tested? Our faith is being tested. When we come up against a challenge, a problem in our lives, we're basically going to be choosing between sin and righteousness. And that's what the trials are. Trials are there to help us confirm righteousness. And we confirm righteousness, and, and when we do this over and over and over again, choosing righteousness over sin, that is how Trials produce perseverance. We endure these things. We go through these tests so that we can become better and better and better at overcoming sin. And as we develop more perseverance, we develop more character. And that character, think about what that contains. That character contains trained righteousness. We become, our character is training to overcome sin. And that character leads to that ultimate hope. We have within our ability, through Jesus Christ living within us, the power to overcome sin. We have that means of obtaining these goals. That's hope right there. Now let's go over to uh, Romans 8, and we'll read verses 22 through 26. We'll continue on uh, this uh, theme of faith. Romans 8 and verse 22. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Pretty loud in my house these days. Not only that, uh, but we also have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption or sonship, the redemption of our body. For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does uh, one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. The object of our hope, the goal, still lies out in front of us. We're working towards it right now. And that is our glorification, redemption of our body, salvation. And not only is this something that we cannot see, right now, 
because it hasn't happened, it's something that uh, literally can't be physically seen. But that's something that we, we hope for. We can't see it. We believe it, though. We have faith that it will happen. Uh, turn back to 2 Corinthians 4, and we'll read verses 16 through 18. Oop, actually forward, not back. 2 Corinthians 4, and verse 16. Therefore we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things that, uh, which are not seen are eternal. The goals that we look forward to are eternal. That's not something that we can see right now. Everything that we can see is temporary. It will fade away. And if there's something to look forward to, and if there's a goal that should drive us, pull us forward, if there's something to believe in with all of our faith, it's eternal life. That is the object of our hope. Turn over to Hebrews 11. Uh, actually, I'll go ahead and read it for you. Hebrews 11 verse 1 is very familiar. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We talked about all of these things that we can't see, and we must have faith that they will uh, come about. This scripture is, uh, int uses an interesting set of words. Um, and to me, what it describes is the uh, true unshakable confidence that true faith uh, is character characterized by. When we have faith, we believe with all of our might and all of our heart that something is true. We believe that it's true almost as if it has already happened, even though it hasn't happened yet. That's how faith needs to feel and behave. Physical evidence provides us proof of things that have already happened. Likewise, faith gives us evidence of things that will happen. In our case, we have the promises of God to hope for and have faith in. Those things are so certain. It's evidence for us. It's proof. The start of our role in hope involves, <clears throat> excuse me, involves having faith in God and trusting in Him rather than ourselves. But we have more action to take as well. As mentioned before, we need to abound in the work of God if we are to uh, truly uh, obtain our hope. We need to be purifying ourselves, overcoming sin. We have to take action that proves our, the conviction of our faith. Let's go to a familiar scripture that talks about that in James 2, verses 14 through 20. <clears throat> James 2, beginning in verse 14. <clears throat> what does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, You have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God. You do well. Uh, even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? We have to take action right now if we believe in the Word of God. 
we play a necessary role in the fulfillment of the promises uh, of God. We do, by our action, by what we do. We have to participate to prove that we believe uh, that the goals of Christianity are worth working for. We work, as we heard in the sermonette today. The hope of the future depends on it. And that hope needs to motivate us. It needs to pull us forward from where we sit right now. If this doesn't move us to action, we fall flat, we will fail. That's all there is to it. Hope, if it is to be achieved, requires taking some action and doing something and not giving up. Turn back to Psalm 119, and I'll read verses 165 through 168. Psalm 119, verse 165. Great peace have those who love your law, and nothing causes them to stumble. Lord, I hope for your salvation, and I do your commandments. My soul keeps your testimonies, and I love them exceedingly. I keep your precepts and your testimonies, for all my ways are before you. We have a necessary link between having hope for salvation and doing something. What is it? It's not sitting back and imagining life in the clouds. No, it is doing God's commandments. That is what we do. When we have hope for salvation, and we're looking for something to do, we start by keeping the commandments. And if we don't, our hope is powerless. Our hope turns to just wishing, and that is not effective. <clears throat> Let's go over to Colossians 1 and read verses 27 through 29. Colossians 1 and verse 27. To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. To this end I also labor, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. There's a lot of work in what Paul described there. Paul is working towards a goal for himself, for you and I. The hope of glory lies out in front of us. And unless Paul actively worked and labored to bring the gospel to the world, what hope would you and I have? We would not likely have heard the word of God. Likewise, if we don't live our lives in a way that demonstrates uh, obedience to God, and uh, then we are not doing our job. We need to be lights on the lampstand so that God's way can be glorified. That's the work that we need to be uh, doing. Our hope and our action actually propagates more hope. When you see somebody else overcoming a really difficult trial, does it make you encouraged that you can do the same? Yeah, absolutely. And it should. We need to encourage one another and build each other up. Let's go over to Psalm 31 and read verse 24. Psalm 31 and verse 24. Actually, I'll begin in verse 23. O oh, love the Lord, all you his saints, for the Lord preserves the faithful and fully repays, repays the proud person. Be of good courage, 
and he shall strengthen your heart, all you who hope in the Lord. If we don't have hope in the fundamental goals of Christianity, then we're missing something. And there's a benefit. We get a boost. God gives us strength when we have hope in God. We will be strengthened, given the ability through Christ living in us, when we have hope. Let's go over to Hebrews 10 and read verses 23 through 25. Hebrews 10 and verse 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. If we have hope now, and we must have it, we have to have it, we need to hang on to it. We can't let it slip through our fingers. It's something we hold on to with all of our might. Now, it is clear that we will struggle. We will undoubtedly encounter discouragement and countless other obstacles. But we can't lose our faith in God. God has given us promises to look forward to, and we cannot begin disbelieving those. And when we do, when we have faith in God, he has faith in us. He believes that we can do it. We've got all of the elements of hope working in our lives right now. We've got the goals. We've got God's Spirit working within us. The strength of Jesus Christ helping us to overcome the sin that we need to overcome and the trials that we need to overcome as well. We work together on all of this, too. We're not an island, uh, isolated from one another. We give each other the encouragement not to lose hope. And I hope I'm doing the same for you uh, right now. We have to strengthen one another so that we can offer the mutual support that we have to obtain the same goals that you and I uh, have together. We need each other. Remember that. Brethren, if we lose everything else in this world, but if we still have hope in God working in our lives, we are assured of obtaining the success and the glory that we look forward to. Mm -hmm.